All right. Hi, friends. What's going on? Um, we're going to let some folks trickle in just for a minute, and then we're going to get started pretty soon because we have, I won't say a, 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 a tick filled, well, it is, it is full of ticks because that's what we're talking about, but a jam packed webinar today. Um, and I'm so excited everyone is here. Um, we're going to go over just how to use the Q&A because we do want to save time for Q&A for you all uh, later on. But we're so excited you all are here. If you want to put in the question box um, where you're from, what kind of weather you're dealing with. We were talking about humidity <laughs> and the fact that we don't like it. Um, but yeah, we're all so glad you're here uh, today. And especially to our members, shout out to our Shelters United members for joining us today for sure. Um, so I'll get, I'll get started just to introduce myself and plug our Facebook page. Um, but my name is Marcy and I'm the Director of Integrated Sales and Marketing here at Shelters United. Um, and if you have ever stopped by our Facebook page on Shelters United, you talk to me. I read all your wonderful comments and questions and direct messages and we would love for you to stop by after or during the weekend when you have time. Um, but that's my plug for today. But um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna get started because we have a lot of great stuff. And I know that Dr. Hope is has so much great education and Julie has great education too. Um, so today we are presenting Recognize and Prevent Tick-Borne Diseases from Intake to Adoption presented in collaboration with Shelters United and our partners at Verbac. Uh, just a little housekeeping to get you started. If you have any questions during this presentation, we love our questions please type them into the question box in your GoTo uh, webinar control panel. And my partner in crime, Mariah, is behind the scenes, behind the curtains. Shout out to Mariah for her help today. Um, and she's going to give me some questions uh, later on that we'll hopefully have time to read in the end. So now without further uh, ado, I'm going to get started here and review just a little bit about, uh, if you've never come to a GoTo webinar, this is what it looks like. Just a really quick um, how-to guide. You can hide the control panel if it just annoys you. You can go into full screen if that's easier for you to see. Uh, the question box is right there so you can see what it looks like. Um, and also you can turn it up or down the volume so whatever works best for you. Um, but yeah, so um, we're going to get started with our intros. And also, I'm so excited too because um, we just jam packed. So, our panelists today Dr. Mark Hope, Julie Bank, Megan Nisley, and I'll give a more detailed bio of them later. But first of all, we just want to thank you for being here today and also thank our wonderful panelists. Um, and for our agenda, just so we know what we're talking about when, uh, Dr. Hope's gonna kick us off for covering education on the main types of ticks that you're gonna see and the areas of the country you'll see them, the diseases they carry, where these diseases are seen the most, clinical signs, and also transmission time of the diseases. Um, after Dr. Hope, Julie's gonna kick us off with more of an animal welfare organization, Side of things with best prevention protocols and practices um, and how to deploy them. She's got some pretty creative ideas on community engagement, which I'm excited for you to hear about. Um, and then Megan's going to wrap us up um, with um, how to make uh, preventing ticks and their diseases more easy and affordable. And then we'll be doing the Q&A at the end and also how you're going to score our giveaway because we have a really awesome giveaway. In fact, we have 10. And they're these adorable backpacks. They're really high quality, super sturdy. Uh, that is Mariah, by the way, who is our gal behind the curtain. And that's her dog, Addie, who's super cute. So stay tuned until the very end and we'll tell you how to score hopefully one of these 10 backpacks. All right, everyone ready? We all ready? Okay. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce um, our main speaker for today, Dr. Mark Hope. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hope, with your time. I know you're really busy and have a lot to do. You help so many pets. Um, but a quick bio, uh, Dr. Mark Hope has 16 years of veterinary practice in small animal, 
equine and exotic medicine. His academic pedigree started with a BS in animal production from Purdue University. In 2002, he obtained a DVM from the University of Missouri. His veterinary career began with equine ambulatory internship, that is quite a word, um, in Ocala, Florida. He decided to make the transition to small animal practice in 2000, 2005 and has had the pleasure of working in many types of practices over the years. In 2014, he decided to pursue his passion for business knowledge and completed his MBA from the University of Florida. For five years, he was involved in corporate veterinary medicine, managing practice, multiple practice locations in the Florida Panhandle. He has had the pleasure of working with Verback Animal Health as a Florida Technical Service Veterinarian since 2017. His current interests center on practice management, parasitology, got that word right, awesome, and dermatology. He lives at Florida Panhandle's Inlet Beach with his wife, Jill, two lovely girls, Shelby and Savannah, along with two dogs, Pippa and Daisy Puddles. Uh, Luke, his oldest, is currently serving our country in the Navy. Thank you, Luke. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Hope. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me change the presenter for you so we can show all your wonderful slides and your information. All right. Thank you, Marcy. Yeah. All right, bear with us as we make sure I get this correct. Awesome, looks great. All right, good deal. Okay, so thank you everybody. Uh, and I wanna thank Shelters United for, for having me on. Um, any opportunity to talk about parasites is a, is a welcome opportunity for me. So much so my wife calls me a parasitology nerd. Uh, I'll start talking about uh, worms you know round worms hook worms heart worms and she tunes out and starts rolling her eyes so uh definitely i like talking about ticks too and it's definitely relevant to not only our pets health but to, to our family's health especially depending on what part of the country that you live in so without further ado we're going to talk about uh ticks and tick-borne diseases and uh, how to protect our pets from them so are you ticking all the boxes So uh, we'll kind of start with the beginning that uh, ticks are not insects. That's something to remember. Um, the adult tick has four legs. Now you will see the uh, younger generations of the ticks, the lymph and the, nar the nymphs and the larvae to have six legs, but that is only because they're an immature stage. But it, when they're adults, they have the four, four legs going on. So that makes them in the same class of uh, um, scorpions and spiders and whatnot. The other thing is they are obligate blood feeders. They have to exist on blood. They can't, uh, they cannot um, go on with life and go to the next life stage without feeding on blood, which uh, interestingly, um, male mosquitoes uh, do not feed on blood. They usually feed on nectar and things like that. So it's the female mosquito that feeds on the blood and transmits all the diseases. So um, that's why the females are bad, bad, bad. So moving on, the other thing to remember is that uh, the ticks that we're talking about today that are important to cats and dogs uh, into veterinary medicine are what's called four stage, um, uh, have four stages in their life cycle. So that is going to be the egg, the larvae, the nymph, and the adult. Females may lay several hundred to several thousand eggs in their lifetime, which is just remarkable. They are reproducing machines. That's her whole goal in life is to get blood, reproduce, make eggs, and, and move on. So um, that is their, their ability to transmit disease is second only to the, to the mosquito. Um, other interesting facts could be like the male ticks may spend four to six months on a host looking for a female. So they'll hang out and uh, wait for that right female to show up uh, so they can uh, have a relationship and, and get those eggs developed. They're very patient. Uh, some eggs and some of the ticks can uh, hatch within uh, as few as 30 days. The other thing that I thought was really crazy, my daughter likes this fact about ticks, she's 11, is that uh, ticks can survive underwater for up to two weeks, which is just crazy. Um, the other thing is unfed adults, they're patient. They can, uh, some of these tick species can live up to three years without feeding, waiting for a host. So these monsters are in the environment and they're waiting patiently for our dogs and cats, so we need to protect them. So this is what I'm talking about on the three, life, uh, three host life cycle. Um, ticks have to feed on intermediate hosts uh, before they get to their definitive host, which is the final host of their, 
um, uh, at, when they're adults. So what might happen is that uh, tick egg is going to hatch and they're, um, the uh, larvae is gonna come out and they're gonna have six legs and they might feed on, for example, here, a chipmunk. And then uh, they're gonna fall off after they get the blood meal. They're going to molt again. So they're gonna become a little bit bigger. And now they might be uh, uh, what's, now they're what's called a nymph. So th in these two things, I've had clients come into the veterinary practice and they're like, look at all these tiny little dots all over my dog, especially between the toes or on the face and stuff like that. And we'd always call them seed ticks. Those seed ticks are actually either the larvae or the nymph stage of these adult ticks that we're gonna talk about in a second. So the nymph stage will feed on another uh, host. Um, certain tick species like to feed on certain, ho uh, certain intermediate hosts and depending on what part of the life cycle is. Uh, and that's kind of important when we especially talk about one particular tick. But uh, most of the time they're non-discriminatory. And then they're gonna drop off, do a molt, and then they become adults. And that's where they're gonna feed on um, uh, an, their definitive host, lay the eggs, and their life cycle is over. So here's the really interesting thing about ticks. And this actually plays into being really important. I know we've got a lot of uh, uh, great people on this call that work in shelters. And I think this is some information to disseminate uh, to your shelter staff about how to remove ticks um, with purpose and so that there's not any kind of residual infection left over. Reason being is, look at the hypostome on these ticks. So I love these electron microscope pictures uh, on there where they have these reversed barbs. And this is gonna puncture the epidermis of your cat or dog. So it's gonna puncture the skin. It's going to um, take a little while for them to find that perfect spot. So a lot of times these ticks like to wander around, but when they find that spot, they're gonna puncture the skin with this hypostome, the mouth part, and it has these reverse barbs, so it's really hard to pull them out. The other thing that they're actually going to do is secrete like a cement-like substance uh, to keep themselves attached. Then they basically make this pooling of blood underneath the skin that they just kind of um, suck blood periodically. And they're not sucking blood continuously. They might take a break every once in a while. And it could take days to weeks sometimes for these ticks to fully get a blood meal, depending on what life stage we're talking about. But the important thing, and we'll talk about here shortly, is that this hypostome and the cement-like substance that they secrete means you just don't yank a tick right out because you're gonna leave parts in, into the, in the skin and that can cause an infection. The other thing real quick while we're at it is that these salivary glands are located right behind that hypostome, the mouth part, this is gonna be the primary spot where a lot of our uh, pathogens that we're talking about, either bacteria or, or even the parasite, and in some uh, human uh, diseases, viruses, this is where a lot of times they live. They're locked and loaded in this tick, and when they bite the, do the, the dog, cat, human, horse, whatever, they actually will be right there to go transmit disease right into the pet. And this becomes really important when we're having a discussion about how to protect our pets against tick-borne disease. So here's a couple pictures of direct disease caused by ticks. So this isn't uh, talking about like Lyme disease, but this is actually what a tick bite physically can do uh, to your pet. So obviously irritation, pruritus around the attachment site can occur. So you get this erythema or redness like you see in the bottom picture. Um, you can actually have anemia from blood loss. This poor puppy is just covered with ticks that you can see there as well. You can get secondary infection at the site leading to sepsis. So these tick bites can get infected and actually cause the pet to be really, really sick over time as well. Um, and then you've got the, uh, the really, I find interesting, but pet owners don't necessarily, it tick-borne toxicosis. And this can develop either due to inflammation, hypersensitivity to the tick or the tick saliva from the pet, or a toxic reaction. And one of the diseases that falls into this category is called tick paralysis. Tick paralysis is when your dog, you would bring to me, and all of a sudden over the past, over a few days, it doesn't happen instantaneously, but your dog starts becoming weak, ataxic, meaning wobbly and whatnot. The muscles become really flabby, and then all of a sudden they just can't walk at all. And they have complete paralysis. They just, uh, their legs don't want to move or, or can't move or anything like that. This tick paralysis is caused by the presence of a tick. And I actually had a client bring a poodle in one time and the dog wasn't able to walk and we're thinking neurologic or you know a, a spinal cord issue or something along those lines. But I did a thorough physical exam on the dog and I just happened to look between the toes, found a tick and I was able to remove the tick 
Um, and that dog made a complete recovery within 24 hours. So that client thought I was like super awesome, but it just goes to show that us veterinarians need to do a thorough physical examination and that the presence of ticks can also cause direct disease to our pets. That particular tick in the United States that was causing that is called the American dog tick. So also called the Derma Center, and we're gonna learn more about it. But there are other ticks that can cause tick paralysis, um, especially there's one famous in Australia uh, for this as well. So the U.S. ticks that are important to us that we're going to talk about is going to be the brown dog tick, or also Rhizopolis, deer tick, which is Ixodes, um, and there's two of them that are, depending on what part of the country, um, here where I'm at in Florida, it's going to be Scapularis, and that's going to go all the way up to Maine and out towards the west, but then the Pacificus kind of takes over in the west, kind of trying to move towards the Rocky Mountains and then to Texas and stuff like that. You've got the Lone Star tick, which is Amblyoma. And then we have the American dog tick, which is the derma center tick. So how do ID ticks can be very complicated. Actually, the seed ticks, your, your nymph and your larvae are really hard to identify. But when you have an adult, it's actually pretty easy to do with these four common ticks. So uh, just real quick, this is not an uh, in-depth tick identification class. But you, if you have a female tick, you can look at what's called uh, the scutum, which is the shield behind the head. And you can see that in, in the diagram there. Um, so the uh, Ixodes is going to have a plain shield for the female, but notice her mouth part is pretty long. And then you've got the amblyoma, also called the lone star tick. She's got just a um, like a yellow dot on her scutum, her shield behind her mouth parts, and a long and a long nose, so to speak, long mouth parts. The derma center, they're very flashy. They uh, the, this American dog tick, she likes to have a lot of color on her shield, but she's got really short mouth part. And then you've got the Rhizopholis, which is the brown dog tick, and they're very, very plain ticks, uh, brown shield and, and small mouth parts. So you can see between the, either the mouth parts or the actual uh, scutum shield that you can identify, at least for the females, your ticks. Now, there are other ways of identifying, and this, but uh, this is just the easy way um, so that you guys can kind of show off to your friends. So let's get down into the four ticks. So brown dog tick, also called Rhizopholis sanguinis, is uh, found worldwide. Most common is going to be in the southern United States. Um, however, this tick is found in all 50 states, including Alaska. And you might go, well, how in the world does Alaska have ticks? And the reason is because of the life stages that this tick, uh, what this tick can feed on. So the brown dog tick can feed on the dog in all its life stages. So it hatches out of an egg and, and becomes a, a larvae can feed on the tit, on the dog, drop off, hatch, become a, a nymph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the adult and then lay the eggs. That means these ticks can exist in your house and they do so. And that's why up in the cold environments, you will find the brown dog tick. And the diseases that they carry can also carry up into the cold north and into Alaska because they can exist inside the home. Now, let me tell you, they once they're in your house, they're in there to stay really well. You gotta get a professional uh, uh, pest control person and it takes multiple treatments and things like that because they can get between the door jams in your walls basically type of thing. So uh, keeping your pets on, on, uh, on tick prevention not only uh, saves them, but it keeps your house, especially in the brown dog tick from, from getting infestations. The next one's gonna be the deer tick or also called the black leg tick. And so this is gonna be Ixodes. Uh, it's usually found in deciduous forests, so um, you know it's it's it likes to be in the woods, so to speak. It's preferred reproductive host, so the, the adult likes to um, they like to feed on the white-tailed deer. So the deer tick usually follows the white-tailed deer population pretty well, and they take a little while on their life cycle uh, it can take up to two years to complete. So here's just a diagram of what the uh, the deer tick might feed on. So you see them hatch out of the eggs, and then what can that nymph feed on? It can be a plethora of things. And then the larvae actually like to feed on, um, you know, the uh, so the excuse me, the eggs, and then the larvae, uh, the first one out of the egg, they like to feed on small rodents or birds, and then they hatch to the nymph, and they're a lot more indiscriminatory as far as what they're going to feed on. And then they become the adult. And that's where they can really like to feed on the white-tailed deer, the human, the dog, the horse, or even your cat. The next thing is the lone star tick or amblyoma. Uh, you can see from the female in the picture on the right why they're called the lone star, because she's just going to have the single white dot right on her back type of thing. 
they're usually found in woodlands and where animals like the rest. Uh, interesting little tidbit is that the larvae, the first one out of the egg, that life stage does not usually carry disease. The cool thing about, or not the cool thing, but the lone star tick is pretty aggressive at trying to bite humans. These guys, most of the time it's called questing where the ticks wanna go up a leaf blade or on a bush and they wait for their victim, their host to pass by and they cling on to them and just passively get on and then take a ride, find a good place to bite and do their thing. But for the lone star tick through either carbon dioxide emissions, vibrations, a number of shadows being cast, these guys get like super excited and they'll run up a leaf blade and really try to actively quest to try to get onto that host. And especially humans, they're, they're uh, gonna be a number one reason why um, as far as getting on humans and, and causing issues. So here's their uh, life cycle. They're pretty indiscriminatory after coming right out of the egg with the larvae stage. The nymph stage, same thing. And then the, um, then the adult stage really loves dogs, loves deer, and loves humans. The next one's gonna be the American dog tick, also called Derma Center. Now they're different as far as where they like to live. It's gonna be more in grassy fields, walkways, trails, that type of thing. And they can uh, also feed on a variety of hosts. And these guys can also live uh, for many years uh, without having a, a, a meal. And so they're very patient um, in their life cycle, so to speak. The other interesting thing and, uh, that I like, again, I'm a, I'm a parasitology nerd, uh, but this has very significant veterinary relevance is the female of the American dog tick can hold the most blood out of all the ticks that we're talking about. When she is fully in, engorged with blood, she can hold 1.45 mils of blood. So 350 derma center ticks or American dog ticks on a single dog can ingest a half a liter of blood. So you double that and they can take a liter of blood and you put that on a small dog, these dogs can get exsanguinated by the American dog tick. These females can hold a ton of blood if they're allowed to be there for a long period of time. So this is a life cycle of the, of the Derma Center. Uh, they like small game, uh, small rodents and stuff for their first round of host. And then they're gonna do the second one, probably about the same. And then the third host, that's where they uh, get uh, onto um, deer, might be on livestock, dogs, and people in, in your kitty cats. So those are the ticks. The next thing to look at is the geographic distribution. So like I mentioned, the brown dog tick down in the uh, lower right corner, you can see because it can feed on the dog on all three uh, life stages, can live almost anywhere because it can live indoors in your house, including Alaska. Your lone star tick, now that's the female that has the, the dot on the back, uh, they like to live in, in the southeast, moving up into Maine and over into the Midwest, but they're not as common in the, uh, in the Great Lakes area and definitely not out west. Then you got the American dog tick, that derma center. Now remember, that's the female that on her shield likes to have a lot of color there. She likes to show off. Uh, the derma center, American dog tick, they take over half the United States and they're actually found in Canada as well. And then the black leg tick, Ixodes. Uh, following the deer population, the white-tailed deer population definitely move up into the Great Lakes, on up into Maine, down here in the southeast, and on into Texas. So where the white-tailed deer go, uh, this tick likes to go as well. So we'll take a pause and talk about the diseases that ticks can give to your pets. I'll check my time, doing okay. Um, thought these were a couple good um, cartoons for, for the kitty uh, folks in, in the audience because we're gonna start off talking about diseases for cats right off the bat. Now, the worst situation for, for a cat, uh, disease that a cat can get from a tick is cytozoonosis. So that's the cytozoan felis. Now, all the other diseases we talk about for dogs are gonna be bacteria. And in humans, we usually are concerned about bacteria or viruses, but this cytozoan is actually a parasite related to, to uh, same thing like malaria, so to speak. And the mortality, meaning the, the amount of cats that can die from this is extremely high, all right? The disease is carried most commonly by that derma center tick, the American dog tick. Occasionally the lone star, um, uh, excuse me, the lone star tick is your most common one. So the female with the dot on the back, but occasionally the derma center tick can carry it as well. So you got two ticks that can carry it. Very hard to diagnose. You got a, a direct blood smear, 
uh, using your microscope is, is one way to do it, but usually you got to send it into an outside lab and they do what's called a PCR test. But these cats come in extremely sick. They're lethargic. Uh, they'll have 106 temperature, which is just outrageous for a cat. So these really high fevers. Uh, they, um, the bobcats are the, um, how it stays in our, in our world. They, they're called reservoir hosts. Bobcats don't get sick. They don't have this high fever possible death type of situation. They just get it and, and they're maintained. So the sporozytes of this parasite, when they um, infect white blood cells, uh, that's when, and then when they rupture out, that's when the cat gets the most febrile and the most sick. They have fever, they go off their food, uh, they can't breathe, they turn ictric, meaning their gums turn yellow, and they're more than likely gonna die in seven days um, of, of clinical onset. Now, if the cat survives that acute infection, then they basically are in, infected for life as carriers uh, because then the virus likes to live in the red blood cell, or excuse me, the parasite likes to live in the red blood cells and can live there forever. Now, the cat will be fine from here on out, but they are uh, reservoir hosts like the bobcat and they can infect other kitty cats. Uh, how we get rid of it is actually putting them on anti-malarial drugs and azithromycin. Um, and it has about a 40% success rate if you try to catch it early. Uh, and so um, basically the best case is try to prevent the disease in these, in these kitty cats from even getting the Lone Star Tick or the American Dog Tick on them. Little uh, tidbit of fact, I was born in Missouri and, and grew up there as a kid and went to vet school in Missouri. Um, and this is this disease was first seen in Missouri, I believe in 1976. So, um, but it's mostly found in the central to southeast, uh, south central part of the United States. So basically my neck of the woods up here in the Florida Panhandle. The other tick-borne diseases, your Lyme disease or Lichia and things like that, uh, are not really, there's actually a lot of controversy on these two diseases on whether they occur in cats as a disease. Now, one Polish study actually found that 9.5% of the cats that they tested had antibody, antibodies to Lyme disease, but that doesn't mean they actually had the disease itself. So you could check a cat and find that they have an antibody to Lyme disease, um, but they never were actually sick. So the big question is whether or not Lyme disease or Ehrlichia which we'll talk about in the dogs, can occur as natural diseases. Now, in, in the laboratory, they can make the cat sick, but they don't understand or don't know why necessarily it doesn't happen to your household pet type of thing. So a lot of controversy on that, and we'll talk more about them with the dogs. Other diseases, though, that kitty cats can get would be, be like babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and tularemia. Um, so those are a little less uh, uh, of an implication, depend, but it depends on what part of the country you're living in that they might be of, of relevance. So talking about U.S. Uh, canine tick-borne diseases, um, this one's actually where a lot of us veterinarians spend time. Unfortunately, the kitty cats don't get a lot of the tick-borne disease conversations other than uh, what we talked about. But you're going to have Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. Uh, you've got the babesiosis and then tick paralysis, but I put that over into the direct um, disease caused by ticks. So we'll start off with Lyme, which is a bacteria called Borrelia. And it's going to, its clinical signs, uh, when it happens, is really fast. So the dog may have a fever, 103, 104. Um, I've had clients actually come in and go, um, you know, they seem to be limping on the right leg uh, yesterday, but uh, today it's like the left. So you can have the shifting leg lameness and it's because this bacteria is affecting the joints of the dog and they can, one day one leg could hurt, but then the other one. They can have swollen joints, their lymph nodes definitely get enlarged. So whenever I'd have a, a dog come in and they've got enlarged lymph nodes and a high fever, automatically I'm thinking tick-borne disease. Um, lethargy, meaning they're just really tired, depression, anorexia, not eating. Um, so this subclin, and then it can pro progress into kind of a subclinical or chronic state where it's just got this, uh, uh, they either seem fine or they might present as having this on and off again um, arthritis going on type of thing. It's Lyme disease is spread by Ixodes or the deer tick. That is your primary um, tick of concern for them. Issue is Lyme disease in the Northeast, um, up in the Great Lakes, uh, down towards Pennsylvania and, and Virginia. This is a really big deal. There's a lot of people that get really, really sick from Lyme disease. 
they actually use dogs to diagnose uh, what the seroprevalence is going to be in a particular area of the country by how high is it in dogs in that area means how much danger is it to humans. So dogs are actually a, sen a, a sentinel uh, carrier or a sentinel being the sentinel being to understand what the disease prevalence might be. So like here in my neck of the woods, they check chickens for West Nile disease all the time. So um, that's where dogs can serve as an indicator of how bad Lyme disease could be for humans in that area. So uh, this is the other thing I want to pause here. So you guys have an outstanding resource called CAPC. Um, it's the Companion Animal Parasit Parasite Council. This is an independent in entity that you can go to, capcvet.org, uh, CAPC and I think I'll have a website coming up here in a second to show that, that it is a great resource to go to. It'll show you what the disease prevalence is in your state, in the country, and you can actually go right down to a particular uh, county. So for example, Lyme disease in two, uh, 2022, um, the number of dogs that have tested positive, so it has to go to a laboratory uh, for them to know what the, um, how many dogs are out there, 3.85% chance that your dog can come down with Lyme disease. Now that used to, when I had conversations with people before COVID hit, that wasn't a big percent. People were like, oh, that's no big deal. But now at this day and age, we have a different understanding of what a low percent can do because you don't want your dog having Lyme disease, right? So one in 30 dogs can come infected with, with Lyme disease according to these numbers. And like I mentioned, this is where you can click on Florida and then you can get granular right down to a particular county. So my county is Walton County. And so um, there's been seven positive cases out of 1,400 dogs that were tested. So a disease prevalence of 0.47. And this is the website, capcvet.org. And if you have not visited it, I would highly encourage you to do so. It's a great educational source, not only on tick, tick-borne diseases, but also parasites, as, uh, other parasites like heartworms, roundworms, hookworms, that type of thing. So ehrlichiosis is another um, big deal. Uh, so that's going to infect the white blood uh, cells of the dog called monocytes. Very similar to what Lyme disease can present at. Acute will be fever, lethargy. The one hallmark is a lot of times the platelets will drop. Now, not just bottom out, but they will be lower than, than expected along with those enlarged lymph nodes. They might also have an enlarged spleen. Uh, chronic, you may not notice that your dog is sick, um, but the, or they might have uveitis, so issues in the, in the eyes, or they might have a kidney issue as well. This is spread mostly by the American dog, uh, excuse me, the brown dog tick. So remember, that means ehrlichiosis has a, a larger range of, of distribution because the brown dog tick does. So this American dog, uh, the, the brown dog tick is carrying this disease. The American dog tick can carry it as well, uh, along with some other Ehrlichia species. So it's not just Ehrlichia canis that we're common, us veterinarians are commonly uh, knowing Ehrlichiosis as. There's other Ehrlichia blanks that can be out there that can cause similar disease. So here's the distribution map. You notice basically almost the entire um, uh, US is, is affected with uh, Ehrlichiosis, including Alaska. And so it's 2.5% um, prevalence uh, for 2022 currently. So they also do forecasting maps of what, how bad it's going to be. They don't do this for all the diseases, but this year they did it for ehrlichiosis, so 2022. So they're thinking that the range is going to spread more further out west, according to this. Uh, so you guys that are out there in um, New Mexico and, and Arizona, better be careful. So the next thing, as we're summing up, uh, starting to sum up here, is tick transmission time. So we talked about the actual diseases in that we pro obviously you guys are going. Uh, we need to protect these these pets, but disease transmission time is really really important because that not all protections are instantaneous. So these are things that I want you to remember. Canine or lichiosis can be infect a dog in as little as three hours. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is pretty quick as well. We didn't talk about the specific disease, um, but the disease that it can give um, can be transmitted in five to eight hours. Anaplasmosis is like 24 hours. And then Lyme disease, uh, the Borrelia, is 24 to 48 hours. So Dr. Susan Little at Oklahoma State is a very famous par uh, veterinary parasitologist, and she's got that quote down there, with recognition of faster transmission uh, pathogens um, upon tick attachment. Uh, we need to use uh, tick, tick preventatives that have a repellent activity 
um, to try to get the ticks off the dogs as quickly as possible, okay? So tick management, we need to protect our pets with uh, topicals, collars, or oral products. The advent of the isoxazolines um, are really good tick per, um, preventatives um, that not only protect against fleas, but also ticks. Topicals have been out for quite a while and they do an excellent job. And then we have the collars um, that kind of are starting to fall out of favor, um, mainly because if your kid starts chewing on a, on a uh, tick collar, um, they can get some issues, same with a cat. You also need to protect the environment, Elim eliminate the tick habitat. So that means you got to clean up leaf litter, you got to cut back the bushes, things like that, do perimeter uh, sprays, and don't feed the wildlife. Do not feed your white-tailed deer so they come up to the house um, because they're bringing the ticks with them and then they're waiting for your dogs. You also got to protect yourself. So properly remove ticks, be proactive about clothing and sprays, and do daily tick checks. So on the pictures, it's showing the proper way of removing a tick. Uh, so you want to get them on their scooter in that shield basically and you want to twist them back and forth you don't want to just pull straight up so gentle back and forth motion trying to loosen that hypostome from its little cement attachment to and then slowly pull up the tick and you want to check to make sure the hypostome or the mouth part is still there because if it's left in there you actually want to dig it out you know taking a little uh, like a toothpick um, i always use dental instruments to try to get that mouth part out because left in there and create an irritant uh, um, and cause infection or more inflammation. So real quick on what to protect your dog with. Now collars, topicals, oils that we talked about don't all have the same kill speed. So your current isoxazolines, those oral products that have come out recently do a great job at killing fleas and ticks, but something to pay attention to is how fast can they kill ticks. So all four that are currently on the market have on their product insert talk about they they control ticks by 48 hours after administration. And then depending on which product you're using, um, can kill a tick within uh, by 48 hours post and reinfection. So if a tick gets back on them, but they had their oral isoxazolene uh, five days ago. Now your topicals with fipronil and permethrin, like our Epitex Plus, the uh, Burback cells, uh, these, that combination actually starts killing ticks within three hours after application. So remember the canine reliquiosis can be as quick as three hours. So the combination of fipronil and permethrin, actually we talk about it, Verbac causes hot feet. So most of the time these ticks never even bite the skin because the permethrin uh, absorbs in through the, the tick's arm or the cuticle, starts causing it to have hot feet, it falls off and then dies. So uh, we have in our studies, and, and most of your fipronil, permethrin, there's lots of other products out there as well, um, have 90% mortality, by, you know, meaning they're killing the ticks by 24 hours. Dr. Craig Datz, who is actually at the University of Missouri where I graduated school, um, talked about that the transmission of Ehrlichia was prevented by permethrin and metacloprid um, products, and uh, but not all uh, dogs were per, uh, protected by either a floxolaner or floralaner, which those are your iso oral isoxazolines, or at least two of them. So keep this in mind of what you're trying to protect your dogs from. The disease you're trying to protect against matters. Protecting kitties, we're almost done. So protecting kitties, do not use dog topical products on cats. Permethrin will kill a cat. And I have treated a lot of cats out there where either the, the uh, owner Thought they put the, um, they, they were mistaken and they put one on the, uh, a dog product on the cat, or they intentionally put it on there, but in quote, smaller doses. Permethrin will kill your cat, so do not use dog products on there. So, Fipronil topical, which is like our EpiPro Plus, Fipronil will do a great job of killing the four ticks that we've talked about, and usually within 24 hours. So, that would protect, it, protect your kitty cat against cytozoonosis. There's also another, there is a really good study out there of the imidacloprid um, flumethrin uh, collar, which is uh, a collar that was formerly owned by Bayer, and I believe Alonka owns it now. Uh, it's found, commonly found in some of the box, uh, big box stores. Uh, that one has a study of demonstrating that it prevents uh, um, cytozoonosis as well. Lastly, I wanted to let you guys know that there's another tick on, on the playing field, and this one is really odd. So it came over from somewhere, they think in Asia, it was first found in like the Carolinas or Georgia or something like that. But what makes this tick so unique is it doesn't care of its environment. You know, I've talked about grasses or trees and things like that. They don't care. 
The other thing is they don't need a male female type of thing. They can actually reproduce asexually. So their tick numbers are just, they just blow up type of thing. These, they've have found entire, uh, they found cattle in the pasture uh, exsanguinated, basically sucked dry by these ticks before. And their, uh, their environment, their, their, uh, where they're living is spreading out west. So if you ever notice a, a weird looking tick like the one up on the screen, it's actually, you would want to report it to your, probably your veterinary board uh, type of thing. Uh, what kind of diseases do they carry? We don't really understand yet. They haven't really um, become vectors for the common ones that we've talked today, but there is concern that it can carry some of the viruses that are uh, um, concerning to people. So here's some tick resources. I've given you a lot of information. Don't expect you to remember it all, but tickencounter.org is great. I mentioned capc.org, um, capcvet.org. The CDC has outstanding information about ticks because Lyme, Ehrlichia, those are human diseases as well. And so they have a really good tick uh, information on there. There's tick management handbook. It came, came from North, uh, um, uh, uh, like, can't remember the actual school that came out with it, but just put in tick management handbook and it's a nice little handbook that's been out for a number of different years. Uh, I think New Hampshire actually came out with it. And then you've got the National Center of Veterinary Parasitology and this is their website. This is actually where Dr. Susan Little works. It's in Oklahoma. And if you ever want a tick identified that you can actually send it into them and they'll tell you which kind of tick it is. So with that, I wanna say uh, thank you and please stay vigilant and make sure you're protecting not only yourself, but your pets. Well, thank you, Dr. Hill. That was really helpful. And I learned um, that no matter where we live, work, travel, ticks are there. <laughs> we should plan accordingly. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and now I have the pleasure of introducing um, our next panelist. So I'm going to take, let's see, I just want to make sure that everyone sees the screen here. Okay. All right. Anyone see my screen? Can you see it, Julie? You see your lovely I can't picture? See it. Okay. I see it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm I have the joy of working with Julie at Shelters United. Um, so let me read her bio for you all. She's a, wonderful and I'm so glad that we've connected. Um, so, uh, Julie is a shelter consultant with Shelters United. Julie believes in supporting organizations with their mission by strengthening their administrative and financial health. Julie Bank is the principal of J Bank Consulting, where she works with nonprofit and government clients and operations, programming and administration. She has worked for over 30 years in private nonprofit animal welfare and governmental animal controls. Uh, leading organizations in New York, Arizona, Oklahoma, California, folks, she's national. Uh, Julie specializes in organizational change within animal welfare and programs that support the human-animal bond. She has worked nationally and internationally on shelter ed and education programs and has visited hundreds of shelters to assist with organizational needs. Julie has a BS degree in management and finance and an MIS degree in contemporary animal welfare and nonprofit management. And we are so delighted that you're here to share your experience and your knowledge with us today, Julie. Well, thank you. And a special thanks to Dr. Hope for all of that great information about ticks. My job today is to pretty quickly go over some ideas on how we can utilize that in our shelter environment. So uh, are you doing my no, I got it for you. You just tell me when you want me to yes. go forward. Go right All right. All right. So um, as you heard Marcy say, I've seen a lot of shelters. And in every shelter that I've been in, uh, I've seen animals that have come in the door looking like this. And I know if I could see you, you'd all be nodding your head saying, yes, you've seen animals that come in the shelter like this. And a lot of times we sit there and say, we don't have enough time to actually address these animals and these animals needs. So what I wanna talk a little bit about today is both operations and community issues that should tell us why we should take the time to create a program that's gonna address this. And if, um, if you go to the next slide. So as we know, 
our job is to try to ensure the five freedoms for the animals in our care. And I know most of you have seen this list, but if you haven't seen this list, this is the five uh, freedoms that we try to live by and ensure for our animals. I think you heard from Dr. Hope that having ticks on your property are, are going to ensure that you don't meet most of these five freedoms. So I'm not going to go through those. You can just take the information that he gave a bit before to go through these to see how having the disease that comes from ticks or having this discomfort comes from ticks ensures that we're not meeting these five freedoms. So having a tick protocol is really, really important. You can go to the next um, slide. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about ticks and what and the community um, and impressions or perceptions, depending on what you want to call it, is really key to helping us with all of our programs, um, everything from intake to adoptions. So if you look at it, uh, having ticks on your property or on your animals gives the impression that the shelter or facility is not clean. You can work so hard to make the organization and the kennels smell good or to feel good when people are there. But if you have ticks, all of that work is going to go out the window. It also gives the impression that the organization or facility, that the animals there are unhealthy. We spend so much time talking to people about why they should adopt a shelter pet and, that and what they're going to get and the value of adopting a shelter pet. But if they see ticks, their immediate brain immediately goes to the fact that the animals in your care are sick. And if they're sick, they're not necessarily going to adopt. And when you have a dirty or a facility or sick animals in your facility, the impression then becomes that we don't care. And we know that we work so hard to ensure that the community knows of the great work that we're doing. And to have people think that we don't care hurts us in our heart. So we want to make sure that we do everything in our power to let the community know that we care a ton. And a tick protocol is going to help with that. The other thing is if people see ticks on our property, they're concerned for their own health or their health of the animals at home. They're going to take the, the ticks home to their animals at home, which could prevent adoption or people even supporting your facility. Um, it could prevent people from touching the animal that comes there when you know that our animals need lots of comfort. They need volunteers and staff to, to cuddle them and walk them and make them feel better and including adopters they need to be touched and that touch is so important, but if they have ticks, they're not gonna to touch them. And in general, people think ticks are gross and you don't want people coming to your facility thinking that you have them because they're not gonna to wanna to really support you. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk very quickly about how to incorporate a program, starting with operations. Um, when you're looking at your policies and protocols and procedures. You want to make sure that ticks are included. Sometimes we just didn't think about that as part of our intake procedures. So having a protocol number one, and if you already have a protocol, review it on a regular basis so you can make sure that all of the new ticks that um, Dr. Hope was talking about, any new information is updated in there. You want to incorporate flea removal and tick removal and prevention into your intake policy. So it should be part of your intake policy, but not only as part of your intake policy, you want to make sure that you have a regular protocol to continue with the protocol. So if you have animals in your care for more than one month, you might consider a flea tick protocol on a regular basis. I'm going to jump down for a second, but most of you have databases. So if you have a database, I encourage you to use the database for your medical protocols. And if you ensure that all of the information and what you've done is put in the database, then you could just run really quick operational reports so you know when any new animal needs to be looked at or any new animal needs treatment. As I said before, we sometimes think that we don't have enough time, but there's a whole world of people out there that can help us with this. So we totally encourage you to take this recording that you're all gonna get next week in your inbox and share it with your entire team and share it with your volunteers and incorporate tick protocols into their training so that they can be supportive and help the, the medical team or the animal care team. And finally, make sure that you're gonna look at your facility on a regular basis. We need to have strong uh, landscape, strong rodent control protocols and processes. And it's not only important for the facility at large, but it's way necessary to prevent ticks in our building. So we're gonna to go to the next slide. 
Um, the next thing to look at, though, is the community. We talked a minute ago about all the different reasons that having ticks on your property can cause problems with your communities from them being your supporter to adopting. So ways to consider controlling that, first of all, regularly talk about ticks. Uh, we don't always do the best job of talking about ticks on our social media, on our website, but having any type of educational outreach Make sure that the tick protocol and prevention is part of your educational outreach. But you might want to go a little bit further, go a little bit further by creating opportunities for prevention. So maybe you can go out and get a grant that can focus on purchasing tick and flea prevention products that can then be given out to your community when you have your microchip clinics or you have your vaccine clinics or even at the time of the adoption. Some people um sell the products at their front counter during adoption and other people decide to underwrite it and bring it to the community directly but either way make flea and tick prevention as important as your microchip and your vaccine clinics and finally incorporate your volunteers like crazy into your process because they could be really helpful if you train them they could be the ones to remove the ticks appropriately based on Dr. Hope's suggestions on how to do it. They could be the one to groom your animals on a regular basis. You could bring in professional groomers on a regular basis to do it, but have your animals being clean as a regular part of their daily care. So it should be as important as your medical care and feeding and exercise and all the other things, making sure they're well-groomed and regularly looked at, and you could do that with your volunteer team. So next slide. So just to end, um, I want to remind everybody that a clean organization, a, a clean organization with a tick protocol equals healthy and happy pets equals adoptions and community engagement, which is everything that we want. So that was a mouthful in a really quick amount of time, but I wanted to say thank you to everybody for allowing me to participate and I'm excited for our next speaker. Uh, thanks, Julie. And uh, can I sign up? to wash dogs yeah. I'm, I'm in man if someone's in san diego area i'll uh i want to get on on that <laughs> are you gonna um, are you gonna send out spend hours sometimes it takes to remove these ticks so it's kind you of no know, <laughs> yeah i i remember the uh the pill bottle with the liquid and that was the, the tick bottle at my old animal shelter job i i don't relish that but i would do it for them <laughs> awesome thank you julie um, and our next speaker is Megan Nicely, um, and I'm so delighted to have Megan. She is also someone I have the joy and privilege to work with, um, and she's an, one of our amazing member consultants at Shelters United. So let me read a little bit about her. Uh, Megan has several years experience in customer relations and sales. Megan has a painted horse named Scarlett, who's 26. Mm -hmm. Oh, sweet. Uh, one rescue cat named Zero and a bearded dragon, Mr. Lingdon's lizard. He's so important, he has a title, <laughs> which I think is awesome. Uh, Megan is passionate about helping animal welfare organizations. She's also a Florida native um, and in her spare time enjoys theme parks and roller coasters. And of course she loves a good Netflix binge. So welcome Megan, we're so excited to have you. Um, please feel free and share what you found as far as affordability with uh, prevention products. Of course, thank you, Marcy, and thank you to Julie and Dr. Hall. Everything has been so informational and so awesome, so I really hope everyone in this I am. I am super excited to be here to help share how we can prevent these ticks and their diseases more appropriately for our members and also the animal welfare community. And a few of you may recognize some of the name brand products that you see here on the left-hand side. But did you know that there are other products that are available that offer the same protection that are just more affordable? For example, buying a frontline shield. If you purchase Effitix Plus topical solution for dogs, you can experience a 90 savings per dose. Same thing goes with the frontline 
if you're purchasing that product, we found a more affordable and comparable product, which is FE Pro Plus Topical Solution for Dogs, where you can experience a 94% savings for dose. And don't worry, we definitely did not leave out the kitties because we found that you, if you switch from using the Advantage name brand product to the FE Pro Plus Topical Solution for Cats, that you can experience a 93% savings dose. So again, these are awesome savings. On average, our members saved $11 per dose when switching to the FE Tix or the FE Pro and we would love for you to take advantage of all of these savings. If you're interested in learning more about these products, as well as just some extra details, please feel free to read the Sheltered Member Consultant, and we'll be happy to answer all of your questions. I am also here to announce that we have a super awesome offer that's happening now through September 30th. If you are a member of Shelters United, when you buy three displays of the FE Plus Topical Solution for Cats, FE Pro Plus Topical Solution for Dogs, or the FE Tix Plus Topical Solution for Dogs, you'll get one display free. That is right, you can buy three and you get one product free. Take advantage of this offer now by logging into your MWI account and you can also see details there about this offer. This is available to all sheltered members. And you can also mix and match between the three products, which is really great. If you need any assistance at all ordering either the FE Pro Plus or the FE Tix Plus, please feel free to reach out to a member consultant and we'll be happy to assist you. The other thing is us member consultants do much more than just helping you find those great offers. We help you maximize your savings by comparing offers and, or sorry, comparing products and pricing. We also can share your saving statements with you so you can see exactly how much you're saving your organization. We also check in periodic with you just to see how you're doing, but also to share promos and exclusive offers with you you can um, for your organization. If you have specific questions about treatments or products, we can also give you additional information that you can take to your veterinarian. The more we enroll or negotiating power that we have to bring you new products, more promotions and exclusive offers from our partners. If you know of an organization that can benefit from some extra savings, please feel free to have them reach out to us. Or, of course, you can drop their name and email in the chat box. If you are sitting and you're like, what is this giant pink banner? Who is Shelters United? I've never heard of you before. What do you do? I am also here to tell you a little bit more about us and how we help 1,400 groups just like you save money so you can in turn save more lives. Shelters United is the purchasing organization that is strictly for non-profit organizations just like you. You can think of us as a buying group specific for animal welfare organizations. We are super passionate about helping you save as much of your hard-earned fundraising dollars as for those amazing goals that you have. We work with manufacturers to obtain discounts on thousands of products that you already use and purchase every single day. With our program and discounts, we helped our members save $2.1 million in 2021. It's been super amazing. And also just remember, when you shop at retailers like Amazon or Chewy, you're not going to see those amazing discounts that you need on those products that you need to help your animals. When you work with us, you get access to over 50,000 different products with 22 distributors across the country and offering same or next day delivering and tons and tons of everyday low prices. 
On top of all of those savings that you get, when you join Shelters United, you get access to special offers and discounts you just can't get anywhere else, just like the FE Tix Plus and the FE Pro Plus offers that you saw here today. We are always negotiating offers that help welfare organizations just like you, so you're not going to want to miss out on them, and all you have is just check your email. <laughs> Our team is also sourcing new partnerships to increase our group's buying power for deeper discounts and new every day. When you join Shelters United, you'll get a dedicated member consultant, just like me, who's like your personal shopper. We're always taking discounts to help you save more lives. And Shelters United brings you so many awesome member benefits exclusive opportunities and offers from some of the nation's top pet organizations. We work with organizations like Burback, Reflectance, Pet Finder, Fear Free, MWI, and so much more. As of now, we have surpassed 1,400 members, and we are continuing to grow rapidly. If you're interested in joining the Shelters United family and receiving some of the awesome discounts that we talked about today, please feel free to reach out to us at info at sheltersunited.com, or of course, you can give us a call or a text to 8 1133. We can walk you through our program and benefits and provide you custom pricing quotes, products that you already purchased, so you can see just how much you can save. Shelters United is also free to join and there's no minimum purchasing requirements. There's also no monthly spending amounts or contracts to commit to. And I, along with my member consultant team, hope to connect with you soon. Back to you, Marcy. Thanks, Megan. Awesome. <laughs> okay, Q and A. Everyone, back to the table. <laughs> Let's bring it all in. Uh, we did get a couple of really, really good questions, um, and I want to jump right in so we can get to as many as possible. Um, a great question, and this is for either, probably for Julie or Dr. Hope. Um, I'm seeing a lot of pet owners making posts on social media that tick preventatives are chemicals and urge other pet owners not to use tick preventatives. What do you say to those people? And how do you get pet owners to understand the reason behind using tick preventatives? Whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> um, my, I mean, I see those posts as well. Actually, in my own neighborhood, I saw something, they were talking about mosquito spraying and, and um, you know, the, the chemicals that were being put out there. Well, I basically live in a swamp and the mosquitoes are all over the place. So there's there's a little bit of give and take as far as what you're what you're putting out there to keep your pets, keep your keep the humans safe from from parasitic diseases. Um, you do you know so for example like uh, permethrin, which is an organophosphate, uh, in high quantities can actually you know cause issues even in a dog. So if you put in a, a, a giant breed dog dose of uh, Fipronil permethrin on on the small dog, you can cause an organophosphate toxicity. And I've actually seen it where people trying to save money will take a large breed dog and you know, dose and try to split it into three on their chihuahuas. And these dogs come in hypersalivating and you know having trouble moving and stuff like that. And I have to get them supportive care through it. So they're not they're not something to play around with necessarily. Um, but I don't I'm not aware of anything naturally quote unquote that can encounter what we're trying to prevent because Lyme disease is devastating to a human. I actually worked for a veterinarian that uh, was misdiagnosed for years and he had, uh, he got Lyme disease in Florida, which was very rare, especially back when he got it, but he permanently has holes in his vision. That's for the rest of his life. He could not see. So as a result, he could not do surgery. He had to have us younger vets do surgery because he couldn't see certain aspects of the surgical field. Um, so Lyme and Ehrlichia um, disease, and then, um, you know, what we talked about with the cats, uh, these diseases have real consequences. The pets are debilitated for life sometimes. Uh, cats can die from their tick-borne diseases, so we've got to protect them. And sometimes it requires using um, products that you rely on manufacturers that have done the safety studies and using them according to the, the label 
the product inserts, what we call it, you know, and that because that has gone through FDA. Some of the products are EPA controlled, um, but they've gone through rigorous screening. Tests have had to been done. Safety studies have had to been conducted. So that's the best thing that we've got. But doing things like uh, I don't even know neem oil and, and these other things just aren't going to cut it. I mean, we're, I'm happy to observe or, or see scientific validation of studies that suggest that natural home remedies do it, but they don't exist. Uh, I I know several holistic veterinarians. And even them, they will tell you when it comes down to some of the parasitic preventative controls, there's just unfortunately nothing out there in nature, quote unquote, that can protect our pets and ourselves from, from these diseases. Right. And I know, Julie, as animal welfare organizations, I'm sure, you know, we get questions all the time about this. I'm sure, how would you address something like that? Right. Uh, A doctor walked up to you or something. Well, I mean, I think the most important thing for shelters is to become the expert and the expert that has the correct information. As we know on social media, we always hear a lot of opinions and we always hear a lot of experts that really aren't experts. So that's why it's really important to have a very clear educational outreach campaign around ticks and other type of, of, of issues here, because as Dr. Hope said, it could sometimes be worse if you don't do it than if you do do it. So making sure that the shelter is the place that people can go to get accurate information and also making sure that your team is not giving out wrong information. Sometimes our staff and volunteers, because we didn't take the time to educate them, is also kind of giving off that wrong information. So having a clear protocol, a clear outreach, and um, incorporating veterinarians in that voice is going to be really helpful. Right, and those links and resources that you gave Dr. Hope, I know in the replay, we'll have those listed, and, and so those are really helpful, I know, for the folks. Um, yeah, I, I, thank you for saying that, Marcy, because I, I really think if you're having a conversation with a, someone that's adopting a pet or you get that pushback on, well, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to put chemicals on, on my new puppy mm -hmm. or something along those lines, take them to capsivet.org. Mm -hmm. it, it is not... Um, they're a complete entity. They're not manufacturer owned or by any means. So um, what they say is, is validated by science and the prevalence is, is concerning in some counties. So if you're up in, uh, up in you know, New York and you don't have your pet on, on a tick preventative, you're putting your dog at risk for Lyme disease and you're putting the people in the household because those ticks are wandering, come into the house, the kid hugs the dog when the, the dog comes in the house, tick gets on the kid, and now your child has Lyme disease. And it can work for adults as well. Everybody likes to give hugs. We've got to protect the family. So it's a uh, capsivet.org is an excellent yeah. resource for education. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, all right, next question. Kind of a, uh, well, my camera's all blurry. I don't know why, why I'm blurry. Oh, well, <laughs> um, underwater. Um, another question is how quickly does tick paralysis happen after a ticket crashes? Um, so I'm, I'm doing this, I can't remember when you, when you crack the book, I can't remember the exact, so don't, don't quote me on this. I'm going by own, my own experience and I have an N of one, but, uh, from, and this has been years, uh, but I, you know, it's the case sticks in my head because of the circumstances, but, uh, it seemed that the, the client brought the dog and it was a slow progression of, so when we use the word ataxia, it means the dog's becoming unstable, you know, they're wobbly and things like that. So that progressed significantly. But when you look at the dog, uh, I remember it. So this was a poodle, uh, very bright and alert in the face and everything like that. It wasn't like a dull, you know, I don't feel good per se. It's just like the body wouldn't work right. And that progressed to, um, to full paralysis and it's what's called a, a flaccid paralysis. So if you have a Dotson that's got a um, intervertebral disc disease, um, depending on the location of where uh, that bulging disc is, they might have like rigid paralysis. You know, the legs might be super rigid or something along those lines. Tick-borne paralysis is very flaccid. The muscles are flobby that you can take the dog's leg and do all this stuff. So to answer the question, I think it's very, um, it might be a, a, it's a few days before you get full clinical signs of what you see. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, the owner was calling me up, just, just, you could just tell the joy in the voice, like less than 24 hours after I took that tick off that the dog was making a complete turnaround and made a hundred percent recovery. Okay. 
I'm going to just because we have like a few extra questions and I know some of you have extra time, which we'll jump back to really quick for those that have to jump off. I know I want to be respectful of the time for the giveaway, just for the giveaway info, because that's important too. Um, do the exit survey and thank you for coming and we'll we'll do um, we'll do a, a drawing for the Austin Penn backpacks. Um, and we appreciate you guys so much and look out for the the uh, the replay and we'll have all those great websites and everything that Julie and Dr. Hope mentioned and we'll have handouts as well for the product that Megan talked about today. Um, but I just wanted to thank you guys for being here and um, if you have time to hang out just for a few Q&A there's some really good questions that are really a little technical that I think some people would be really excited um, to learn about. So for you all, thank you for coming. Please do the exit survey. Um, and I'll scroll up here. Let's see. Uh, another question. Um, are we seeing resistance with fipronil in ticks like we're seeing with fleas? Uh, actually, so that's a really good question. Um, I am not aware of any as such, you know, so, but I, I don't know 100% that that's not the case. Now, obviously, um, it, it's a lot more acutely aware, uh, me as a veterinarian with the fleas, because there are established uh, studies um, of resistance to fipronil and imidacloprid. Dr. Dry, uh, Dryden at Kansas, uh, Kansas State's got some famous studies on that. So, um, but as far as ticks per se, uh, so especially when we're talking about the cat, you know, where you just have to rely strictly on fipronil. Um, I don't, um, I'm not aware of anything 100% that they're, they're showing resistance to that at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So I can, I'd be happy to, if there, I can make a literature search and get the information to Shelters United to, to sure. answer the question if you want, so. You have some nerds here too. Okay. <laughs> some nerds in the crowd uh, that like a, stuff like you do. <laughs> I don't think uh, I'm not. I, I hate to say no and be wrong, so I can I can sure. kind of okay. check around. Um, another question: If the tick head stays in the host, will it continue to transmit disease for any period of time? Um. So I guess I'm as far as the so. I'm not understanding the question super well. I, I think when what you're asking is, you know, so the tick's going to have the attachment. There's a lot of preparation that has to happen for the tick. So they've got to wander around and find the perfect spot. And then they're going to insert that hypostome and secrete their cementum in there. And they actually uh, create trauma just underneath the skin to make a, a well of blood so that it pools in there and they secrete anticoagulants. A lot of that takes time. So it's not just like a mosquito where they uh, inject and, and then the disease is transmitted, that type of thing. So there's a lot of prep. And the other thing that I mentioned is that ticks are um, not consistent blood feeders. I mean, they take breaks. They're like, Whew, I'm gonna take a moment, just kind of hang on, ride around for a little while. Oh, no, I'm, I'm thirsty again. I'm gonna start slurping and, and going to town type of thing. And when we talk about tick transmission time, um, you know, it just depends on the bacteria that we're talking about, Borrelia to, um, you know, the, the, the spirochete or the rickettsials and stuff like that, of just how fast can they get through the mouth part from the salivary glands of the tick and into the dog's body. Uh, so those general transmission times are, are a, a, a minimum, so to speak, you know, that they can happen that fast. So will Ehrlichia in every single dog transmit within three to four hours? No, I'm not saying that, but that's been the fastest documented time. Could take 24 hours, but the problem is we don't want to risk it. And so you want to use a, a, a preventative that's going to, um, if Ehrlichia is important in your area, like here in the panhandle, you should be using a preventative that, that is minimally protecting the fastest transmission time possible. Sure. I hope that answers the question. Um, another question. Do you have a, a preference between topicals or orals? <laughs> Well, my company does not sell any orals as of yet uh, for ticks, especially. Um, so in practice, you know, I'll just use my my practice preference. Um, you know, it's it came down to what the client wanted the fastest, and, and unfortunately, fleas drive the conversation way faster than than ticks do. So 
here to say, I'm not going to sit here and say that your fipronil pyrethrin uh, topicals will kill fleas as fast as oral isoxysazolines. That's why those those compounds are so freaking amazing. I mean, killing um, the only thing that kills fleas faster is Capstar, you know, and that's in 30 minutes type of thing. So to be able to kill fleas is up, you know, you start seeing fleas die within four to five hours. Uh, doesn't mean they're all dead in four to five hours, but to start seeing them die with those isoxysazolines are amazing. The problem is fleas are not ticks, okay? And ticks are not fleas. So the tick is an entirely different being and it takes the isoxysazolines longer to kill, kill those ticks. And that's why on all the isoxysazoline labels, they say they're killing the ticks by 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So fipronil and permethrin and some of the others that we've, um, other topicals that are out there in different combinations have faster kill times. So if you are concerned about tick-borne disease, which you should be if you're living in certain parts of the United States around the Great Lakes and where Lyme is, especially, then uh, you should be using a topical. Isoxysazolines, um, well, you know, isoxysazolines have a couple, one particular uh, product's got Lyme prevention on their, on their product. But um, if you're concerned in general about maximizing protection for your pets, you know, you got to keep in mind that Ehrlichia and, and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever can transmit a little bit quicker. I know that's not giving a direct answer. Um, I don't think veterinarians are concerned enough about ticks unless tick disease is staring you in the face, like up in the Northeast, like my counterpart in New York City. That's all his veterinarians are really, really concerned about. And we, we do really well with our product up there. Down here in the South, where my, my veterinarian counterparts, when I talk to them, should be more concerned about ticks than they are. But clients are concerned about fleas, and so they, they go with the faster flea killing product. Right. No, it's that's enlightening, and it is something we should. I mean, that I've learned personally that I need to care more. That we all should care more. Um, um, no, that's a very good answer. Um, and then the last question, kind of a aha moment as well. Um, I thought a tick needed to be attached 24 to 48 hours before transmission of any disease. So this means that ehrlichiosis can be transmitted in as little as three hours until it attaches. So, mm -hmm. yep. So that's um, <laughs> yeah. So that's um, there's multiple studies that demonstrate that, um, which you guys may not have access to. But it, it capcvet.org has a lot of parasitologists that um, are quote unquote on that council, and a lot of general veterinarians, and then a lot of parasitologists that aren't veterinarians. Long story short, they aggregate all that scientific data that I have access to that a lot of people can't have access to and put, put it into a really nice digestible form. So you go to Orlikia on, um, on the CAPC website and you'll see that transmission time. And that's, right. that's them putting in, in a little bullet point that that's how fast it can happen. So um, I'm glad I uh, made some awareness for some yeah. folks. Uh, I've never, you know, you know, on the SNAP tests that we do for our heartworm disease, it will test for Ehrlichia, Borrelia, which is Lyme, and anaplasmosis. And I've had a lot of dogs that will pop up positive for Lyme, but they never were necessarily um, sick. You know, they never did it. But I have had dogs that were sick with Ehrlichia. Um, and so it's a it's, uh, disease to pay attention to and we need to protect. No. Yeah, thank you. You know, we're, you're, your learning is already being processed <laughs> after the initial heebie-jeebies that I, I got, um, but I learned a lot. And um, I want to thank all of our panelists. That's all the questions we have. Um, thank you for everyone for attending today, for our members. We're super excited to see you here. Um, and we're here to support your life-saving efforts with webinars like this, where we can get the heebie-jeebies, but learn together. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and end it. And I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week and have a great weekend. Thank you.